Assalamu alaikum and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are. Now it's my final session with the young people of Islamic Leaf Switzerland. It was supposed to be discussing the quote, uh, causes of extremism, radicalism, and terrorism, but because it involved about 10 or 15 slides and they have to catch the plane, I have to change it for a good open discussion. Question should be raised by you people and I try to answer them inshallah. All right, yes, let's start. First question. Yeah, I can start. Um, so I have a question. Um, so we, um, now we are in Switzerland, but I, I, from what I see, from what I know, the context in England, Canada, US, uh, is more based on communities, so it's okay there to like build around community uh, and they have a different mindset than other European countries like France or even Switzerland. So how do you like com uh, communicate, market and uh, build relationships in this context, for example? So let us understand what and how the British learned from maybe living or conquering or ruling many nations during the occupation of these countries. I think the British learned a lot of how to deal with nations, how to deal with people. <coughs> That's why they are more tolerant than other European countries. Uh, America and Canada represent new immigrant or new immigration. They are not the native people of these countries. And 90 plus percent of the people living in Canada and America, New Zealand and Australia, are not native. They are, all of them are immigrant to this newly discovered land. With the context of being born from Britain, because they are a part of the British, global British Kingdom. So they manage to take some part of quality of the people in Britain who actually were tolerant sometimes to the people that they are occupying their countries than other European countries. You see the difference between certain countries such as even uh, Belgium when they were conquering Congo, Portugal when they were conquering Mozambique, is that Mozambique? Yeah. Uh, France when they were conquering Algeria and West Africa. Big difference. Even the arrival of Christopher Columbus to America, especially to the South, and denying the arrival of the Arabs and the Islam to this part of the world five, six hundred years before, or more than five, six hundred years before he arrived. This is Spain. Spain, Portugal, France, even Holland, in uh, Indonesia as well. So when you look at the differences in uh, Indonesia and South Africa, the Dutch, when you look at the people, how they are, if you put these five or six or seven countries together on the table, Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, Spain, Portugal. You need to study how those people dealt with the conquered countries and nations during the occupation of these countries. 
then you can make judgment. I don't want to become judgmental, but I will ask you to go back. What the six or seven countries? Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, Spain, Portugal. Okay? And see how each one of them treated the local people differently. And find which one of them was more tolerant than the other. I'm not asking you to compare them to how the Muslim conquered these countries and then power the local community, which is another added factor, whether they are from the Ottoman time, or they are from the Abbasid time, or they are, or they were from the Umayyad time. If you put these nine countries or nine areas together, you understand the difference. You understand that Muslims never eliminated a race, never eliminated a religion. That's why when they came out, they came out as empowered local community. Okay? Still, churches, synagogues are in the place of being ruled by Muslims hundred years or thousand years later on. This is the answer to your question. Now, instead of six countries, a combination of nine, including Abbasi, Ottoman, and Omeyya. Right? Yes. Um, I think to the point that the Islam uh, said, uh, I sort of, I want to solicit more uh, sort of like guidelines or like advices that we don't really hear in terms of uh, the way forward. Uh, the reason I'm asking is because mostly the technological revolution is making huge changes both uh, in our lives, in our real lives and virtual lives. And there is a mix of both lives into one. Now, what do you think the impact of technology will be in the near and far future and uh, how we can reap the benefits of it in order to use it as productively as possible in the, for the goals of uh, humanitarianism. Okay. It is how we use technology. If we use technology to eliminate the role of man, this is the wrong use of technology. If we use technology to decrease the number of jobs, this is the wrong technology. Mm -hmm. If we use technology to gain more money and having no role for the man, I mean man and woman, and changing them into robots, that's the wrong technology. Mm -hmm. We should use technology to create more jobs, to allow jobs to be done by more people. That's why our technology has to make new discoveries. Discoveries on Earth, discoveries in the depth of the seas, discoveries on the height of the sky, discovering in the oceans. Because we cannot afford to say that the AI, artificial AI, yeah, artificial. artificial intelligence will eliminate the jobs of man. This is anti-humanity. Anti-humanity, so what the man will do? Nothing. No. Your technology should not be only built on the economical benefit of the few who are in charge in technology, who are in charge in science. They don't care about the others. That's why if you remember yesterday, I was talking about the tradesman or the trader and the businessman. The trader in Egypt, he said, I trade to sell, yeah. not I trade to make money. I can make a profit, but instead of making 50% or 60%, 70%, I've made 5% to make my commodity available for everybody. And he said, I trade to create jobs for young people. 
not to reduce jobs and replace the young people by robots. This is a different philosophy of how can we look at how to use the technology. Technology has to help me in more discoveries so I can create more jobs to more people in different parts of the world. Look at the vast area of desert on Earth, whether they are in Africa, or Asia, Latin America, America, and this huge area, like a country like Egypt, 80% of it is desert, or 70% is desert. What am I going to do? I have to use the technology to make discoveries, to use, to, 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 to help the people to create jobs for them. There's something newly developed called the blue economy. You know what the blue economy is? The economy of the ocean, the economy of the sea, to be used by the individual human being like yourself. Okay? And the others. So the blue technology, or the white technology, or the green technology, or the black technology, or whatever you call it. Here, philosophically, we have to keep developing scientifically the technology itself. But, with the objectives of the tradesman, who said it 60, 70 years ago, to create jobs for people, and not to make the cut for the few, but to reduce the cut, to allow the plenty or the many to benefit from the technology. Look at the profit. Google, Facebook, what else? TikTok, Instagram are making. If you collect all of them together, it might be trillion. How many people are in charge of these six or seven or eight or ten huh? platforms? the owners of this platform. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Here, the idea of technology, the idea of scientific discovery has to be created to help the people. Okay? Not just to help the few. But and when we are in the, in the field, yes, well, more precisely, Uh, nowadays, there are theories that say that you can pay for a kid to go to school, university, everything, or you can just give or hand them a computer, because today we have access to all the information we need. Do you think that as part of the uh, humanitarian response to crisis around the world, in addition to food and other necessities, do you think that providing some sort of basic technology should be considered as part of humanitarian packages? The most important friend to the child is the book. Even some of the European countries now are reviewing the distribution of tablets in the schools yes, exactly. or the reprinting of the books again. Yeah, this is what I meant. Actually, well, There's no harm of printing the books and enabling the children naturally to seek knowledge as well as giving them a tablet to advance seeking the knowledge. So we cannot say it has to be only printed books. We have to put the printed books as textbooks books for children to, to enable them to read. Because if I want to read something now on the internet, I cannot look at it more than five minutes. There's no science. There's not knowledge. Just picking up something. But I want the child to be able to read. Then for me, they can write. But this is the nature of how Allah created us to learn the knowledge. But at some stages, if you want to obtain a fast information, you need to use the technology as well. So if I divided the syllabus between the tablet distribution and book reading, I gave 
60-70% for the book reading and 30-40% for the tablet. I'm not going to close the door against the tablet, but I'm going to ask the child to learn how to read. Yes. Um, earlier it was yesterday and also I, I, I saw it uh, since I started. Sometimes uh, it might be a, like maybe, I don't know if it's a bad question, but I, 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 we discussed the fact that sometimes the fact that we are called Islamic Relief can have some, we can have some issues with um, banks, partners and stuff. So we know that the turning point was 20 uh, 2001, uh, on September. Um, at some point, did you, with the board and people that were making Islamic Relief, were thinking of renaming the organization? This discussion happened in the mid 90s. Okay. Between the members of Islamic Relief family, particularly the French and the Belgian, the Francophone. Because at that time, there was a lot of uh, bombing of the underground in Paris. And the French office was heavily engaged of finding lawyers to protect Islamic Relief France. Mm -hmm. And the question was raised, shall we keep Islamic Relief as a name or shall we change it? We decided to keep it. Why? Because we wanted everyone to learn how to deal and work and build partnership with credible, professional, integral organization. Yeah. Then after that, we can create other organizations called any names. This was the decision nearly less than 30 years ago. Nowadays, after giving the confidence to the Muslim community of creating such umbrellas or such individual organization, you can call it any name you want. You have to be the catalyst of showing everybody we succeeded with an Islamic name. If you want to carry on, good for you. If you want to do it with something else, good for you. But to give the confidence to the young people that as you have succeeded over the last 40 years to maintain your name with difficulties, Others can follow or can have a different name. So in the field work of the social life, there's nothing called one size fits all. What it fits you in Bosnia, in Macedonia, in Balkan, does not, could not fit you in the Middle East. And what fits you in the Middle East could not fit you in the, all the countries of the Middle East. What's suitable for the Saudi might not be suitable for the Emirati, and so on. So there's nothing called one size fits all. Okay? Clear? Yeah, because I saw that uh, uh, Belgium actually has another name. Yeah. And also French, it's... Uh, yeah, Sif. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we give them the chance either to stay within the family or to leave, they decided to leave. Okay. That's why they became different entities. Have yes. you, have you uh, alhamdulillah, so now Islamic Relief has expanded in many con continents in the, in the world, yet there is still one continent to, to reach, which, which is South America. Okay. Were well, there like any discussion, you know, to expand Islamic Relief to, to, to there? You see, uh, there's some work that's been done in Latin America by Islamic Relief USA. Okay. The Islamic Relief Canada, but they have not opened offices yet mm -hmm. this area. Uh, most of the donors of Islamic Relief globally mm -hmm. are Asian, mm -hmm. which uh, mainly Pakistani, Indian, Bengali. Sometimes that America might not be seen as appealing for funding, mm -hmm. but if you want to overcome this challenge, the only project which can survive, the only project which can survive, yes, the only project can survive is uh, orphan sponsorship 
with the sponsorship. Because this is appealing for everyone, whether it's in Latin America or in different parts of the world. Okay. But as I said earlier on, actually the majority of the donors of Islamic belief are from UK, Canada and USA and some from the Middle East and all of them are Anglophone, mm. not Latinophone. But that does not stop you from having a feasibility study to open offices. Because I remember uh, Chi Guevara, remember him? Yeah. When he was a young medical student, he went to visit the area of the mining industry, which is the north of Argentina, and they found the depth of poverty. He was shocked, because he was from a middle class family. The year after that, he took a gap year and traveled to the whole Latin America with a motorbike. And he developed what, can we call it in Spanish, Hispanic. What does it mean? It means we have the same language, speak the same language, we have the same religion, we have the same culture. Why people are dividing us into different countries? Mm -hmm. And he started his revolution. And he joined Fidel Castro in Cuba and deliberated Cuba, not only from the foreign Nars, but from the landlords who were enslaving people mm -hmm. in uh, Cuba at the time. And he was made a minister of economy. But he did not like that because he wanted to keep teaching people to liberate. He traveled to Africa mm -hmm. to learn about the revolution, Africa and other countries. Then he came back to Bolivia to start to help the people there, and this is where his life ended there, by a farmer who informed the police about this man. He did not know who was Che Jafar at the time. But when we look at his journey, the short journey, he's talking about Hispanic. And if we are the same, why are people dividing us? So Latin America has different flavor. The culture is closer to the Asian culture or to the Arab culture. Okay? Actually, uh, but you need to find uh, projects that can attract your main donors. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because you have a constituency and you are not uh, obliged to help everybody because you can't help everybody. But you are obliged to make your service impactful through different ways. Right? Yet I'm convinced there is a Muslim community that is expanding in, in the Latin America. Yes, there is. It's still small, but you know it's expanding. It's struggling. It's struggling to be organized, to to have their own spaces, uh, and so on. So maybe you know we're not going to do like big projects yeah. like we do in other places, but maybe like social justice would help. The experience that, for example. Uh, Islamic Relief Canada or USA has can be maybe you know transferred to these places and and both help but also like advocate for new donors as well. There is uh, many uh, Arab descendants you know living in, in this area, so I really believe there is a, a tryout of this to, to be done. You know, in Colombia, for example, and so on, and see how things go, and then maybe give Islamic Relief a, a new flavor as well. Nobody said that you don't do that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes your limitation is two things. Is you have to employ people mm -hmm. to look after this part of the world mm -hmm. and have to find fund mm -hmm. to support those people. Mm -hmm. That's why I, at the very beginning I told you the most appealing project is orphan and widows. True. Whether it's Latin America or any part of the Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes.
Mm. Earlier you said, and uh, I think Ilya said that uh, one of the saddest thing when uh, they did uh, thing at the, at the uh, UN mm. um, in 1991, it was uh, like Finland, you said? Uh, Ireland. Ireland? That uh, supported. supported Islamic Relief instead of Arab, uh, Arab uh, countries? Um, oh, instead of three Arab countries. Not all Arab countries. Because in the meeting of three Arab representatives. And which one? No, no, I don't I want to make it public. Okay. So ah, 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 ah. so just don't file and how and so was it frustrating? Of course. When I went to discuss this with the three of them, one of them told me, We have Islamic name. And we decided to put you on a roster status. Come after two years. The second one was telling me, what's your relationship with Al-Dawah society? Al-Dawah society was a Shia, Iranian society at that time. The third one did not open his mouth. He was scared. So I did not know what was Al-Dawah society, Gamayat Al-Dawah. Then the man who told me among the three representatives, your name is Islamic and to put you on a roster status. I said, what do you want me to do now? To change the name of the organization? What a stupid statement to be mentioned by a diplomat. Coming to your time. On that day, which was Friday, I went to the stage without any permission. Yeah. Give me your... Uh, and I took the microphone. I started to speak. The chairwoman said, Sir, can you come down? I said, I'm not going to come down. Not going. I've been here for a week. Give you everything you want. Why you have an answer for me? Say it, come down. Say, I'm not going to come down. Give me an answer. That's why the Irish stood up and supported us. But the three Arab countries were there, kept quiet. The fourth country, which was Sudan, he supported us in the discussion uh, on Monday, following Friday. So, when we had two countries supporting us, one from Europe and one from Africa, they got the registration. But the other three, they could have done it discreetly, but they were so scared. Or, their behavior at that time was not Islamically friendly. And they were scared of their own government. This is 1993. That was 30 years ago. 30 years ago. But you have to fight. In places like this, don't be scared to speak up. Because among the audience will be people who can stand up and support you. And this is what happened with the Irish. The Irish was not supporting us because we have a beautiful face or emotional speeches. No. You know what he said? We have received all the information that we need to take from the Islamic cliff. We have received their reports. We have received their financial report. Even we have received their donation to the United Nations in Bosnia, where they donated 300 metric ton of wheat flour to us in Bosnia. What else do you want them to give you? Before he became emotionally supporting us, we gave him all the documentation. That's why he stood on the firm ground. Somebody like this will never stand on the firm ground if you don't give him 
the right information. Who we'll give the right information, that's why it's stored for us on the firm ground. That's why coming back to conclude this one, if you want to make da'wah to the West, make da'wah on science and technology written in Quran. Don't make da'wah on emotional stories happened to the prophets and messengers of God. They will turn them back to you. But if you will knock them down with the technology, the technology of science in Quran, you will knock them down. Because they believe in technology, they believe in science, they believe in something tangible in their hand. That's why when we give all these reports to the Irish, they stood up firm to support us. Yes, sir. You, you fight, you know, to get there, to have a place, you know, in the vehicle. Um, but I feel like at the moment, maybe it's temporary. Uh, Islamic belief is not very at present. What? In, in the UN. No, it is present. Yeah. No, 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 Islamic Leaf is a member of the ECOSAC, the Economic Social Status, have the Economic Social Status of the non-government organization platform in the nation. Up till now. Yes. Even one or two countries, without mentioning the names, trying to remove Islamic Leaf from this. It does work this way. The people were laughing at them. Because we have been registered, voted in to come. You want to remove them, vote them out. But there's nothing to vote them out. This actually being left to IRW to attend because we, we at my time we used to receive all the invitations to every meeting happening in the United Nations. Was in New York, was in Washington, was in Geneva, was in any part of the world. Conferences, meeting and others. And we were through the external relations department sending this invitation to some countries. Maybe America attended a meeting in New York and people from Switzerland attending and so on. That's why sometimes they find people come from the IRW to Geneva to attend meeting. Mm. It's still, still there. So now it's, it's still yeah. active? Yeah. Mm. It's still there. Do we have a representative, like an official representative? We used to have, but now the representative is not just a representative. It's actually, it should be the CEO, and CEO and the external relationship could distribute the invitation to other countries, like France, Belgium, Holland, Germany, Italy, and others. Or even to fill the offices, to attend on their behalf. You said earlier that uh, the network and building strong relationship with the uh, you know, administrations and stuff. So we should continue this way of that's right. Knowing the right, knowing that's people. right. And um, it's, it's not or even if we get the if we have everything in place now, we should strive to continue. There's nothing called everything in place. Everything. You have to maintain everything in place. Mm. If you think that everything in place now, you might be taking off because mm. you are not attending. That's why one of the functions of Islamic Leaf Switzerland is building the relationship with UN yeah. bodies as well as the ICRC, IFRC. Exactly. This kind of Because we had someone. Before. We had like uh, vegans, uh, lady named. Wiggins? Yes, she left, right? I can't Angela Wiggins. I, mean, I can't remember. Yes, it should be external relation. Um, Either she, somebody from come from your UK or somebody from you yeah. will be attending all the meetings. I have a question about the specificity of Switzerland. Uh, with uh, Jamal here, we talked about the... Uh, because every country, like the... Uh, the Muslim community in every country is different, we have to know about That's right, yeah. Uh, in, in what direction do you think that the 
Islamic Relief Switzerland of this year should be moving forward, given the specificity of the... I region. think Islamic Relief Switzerland, Islamic Relief New York, Islamic Relief Vienna, mm -hmm. Islamic Relief Jordan, or Islamic Relief Kenya, where there's heavy presence of UN and UN agencies mm -hmm. and the international community should have a strong external relations department in this country. Mm -hmm. Strong external relations presence in this country. This besides your fundraising. Because if you have got somebody full time attending the meeting, through his job or her job, will be able to bring money for you. Because they know you, they see you, they give you money to implement for on the ground. That's why Islamic Relief Swiss has two functions. To be like a local fundraising office to support the international operation. Then to be the having the connection of the international community in Switzerland. So you are not new and, uh, offices. UN offices and the International Community of the Red Cross That's right. ICRC. That's right. Yes. Yes. Your... Uh, regarding the, the latest uh, news that arrives about the smear campaign that has been uh, done against Islamic Relief and now it's showing, I mean, the public sh is discovering that it, it was all a smear campaign. It it's it's, it's so not the first time, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be the last time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, such a government who supported or financed this smear campaign is still not happy with not only Islamic Relief but with Muslim led charitable organizations in the West. Mm -hmm. Some of these governments do not believe in civil society sector or creating civil society organization. They have a plan but they want to oppose their plan on you. So the smear campaign as I said it's going to be the first and going to be the last. It will happen again and again and again, but you have to be very careful of what you put on the social media mm -hmm. and what you publish. All right? On ordinary media. Okay? You said that they are not happy with the work that not only some Relief but other Muslim charity organizations, even other organizations, but why? It is their attitude. <laughs> you hate Islam. Do I have to write to you why you hate Islam? Honestly, I don't like Islam. But they are Muslim countries. So what? You see, when you work with others, they see Islam differently. They see Islam as a cuddling toy inside the mosque. Okay? As a little infant or little baby looks beautiful and nice, but inside the mosque. Did not see Islam as a powerful message you've got, making social change. They don't see Islam as empowering local community, because if you empower the local community, you challenge the status quo of such corrupt regimes. Okay. That's why this is how some of those governments see Islam as a threat for them. Because Islam talk about shura or democracy, talk about creating new leadership or changing the leadership, which they don't want to be changed. They want to be there forever. Because they are benefiting from being in charge forever. They don't want to make that change. This is the saddest part. You know, it's not just the, the registration process of the Islamic Relief in 1993 and we didn't have the support, but it's also afterwards, like now, as I mentioned, like a Muslim country paying, actually, spending money of the budget, of the taxpayers' money, 
in order to finance some intelligence services to come up with uh, facts that are not sometimes really verified so that we can proceed with this smear campaign. And sometimes I think that uh, the biggest enemy is, you know, we have an expression in Albania, it doesn't sound well if I translate it in English, but when we say the rock is closer than you think, means the enemy maybe is between us and not outside of us, in the sense of those that propagate Islamophobia and everything. So sometimes it's those countries and people that are supposed to create this link and uh, for development yeah. and cooperation. Do you remember what the Kafir of Christ said? They used to worship many idols that they create themselves. The authority that they have in their hand has been taken, has been taken from them by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and said the one and oneness. They didn't like that. Here, those statesmen are concerned to be the, the, the legislator. They don't want you to come and tell me Omar and Abu Bakr and Osman said that and you are not doing that. They don't want that. But they want you to keep quiet and give you money, put you in your job, to stay in your job, and that's it. Because if they start giving the right to a civil society organization, the civil society organization will question them. Tell them that you are wrong or you are right. Yes? Any other questions? Ya Allah. Do you have questions for us? My question to you is if you want to become a lion, you have to have the quality of the lion where you make everyone else to respect you. If you want to become a chicken, you have to understand that a rat can eat you, but the rat cannot eat the, the, the lion. Lion in my context is knowledge, experience, and interaction with the community. Knowledge is giving you the ultimate platform for community leadership. Because when you speak to the public, you speak from the knowledge background, from the experience background. So people will listen to you. Not everybody will listen to you, but the people who have the logic will listen to you. So what, it depends what they want to be. You want to come to Islamic if to have a job and leave, you're wasting your time. You want to come to the organization because you want at 3 o'clock to leave, it's a waste of time. Because the fruit comes after 5 o'clock. The food comes during the weekend, or during the morning, during the holiday. It's a 24-7 uh, dynamic processing process. Dynamic processing process. And with the processing process, the processing process itself has to be processed again. I'm using my Arabic metaphor to raise the level of the English spoken language which you speak it, or the little French speaking spoken language, because the English is 600,000 and the French is 160,000, but the Arabic is about 12.2 million. So when you look at that, it depends what you want. You want to become a doctor, you go to the education system, 
work hard, then become an engineer, go to the education system, work hard. After becoming a doctor or an engineer, what else you want to have? You want to discover a new discoveries? As a doctor or engineer, you have to go onto another track. And when you go to this track, the track will end, then you can start another track and keep going and keep going and keep going. So at your age, for your job, you shouldn't be chicken. But the maximum you can do is just when a fox comes to you, when a rat comes to you. No. A lion will never eat chicken. It's too little for him. But a lion will eat the big prey. The lion is knowledge, is experience, is education, is awareness. This is the lion. Okay? If you want to take the job easy, easy job, okay? It'd be like millions, like billions, who have no weight, no color, no shape, no impact. If you want to make the impact, you have to make it through education, experience, and knowledge in general. You got it? Yes, total. What's next for you? Next in what? So now you are in the. Uh, you are building this. Uh, it's been five, 15 years that you were your part of. Uh, uh, the yeah, for for M and the other thing, and in your vision, do you do you see uh, new things that can be built? Uh, uh, like soon or you, you I don't know in your vision you will continue this way or you have other ideas communication as I mentioned yesterday is very difficult to achieve network and communication partnership but what we started to do, to, to do since last year is producing our documentation okay because the Arabic library is very poor in literature Especially in social and material work. Most of the books are translated from English or French. Most of the theories are translated. I'm not saying they're bad, they're good, but they don't carry your culture. What we have done last year is we changed the conference into a book about humanitarian dimensions. What we're doing at the same time today or this year for the conference which is happening in uh, less than two weeks' time about Yemen, is to have another book published about the future of material. This is something we need to develop. To start putting those books in the library, so because we make it in Arabic, we should make other people to translate into English and French and German. Culture should not be one way. Culture should be multiple direction. So what we are trying to do now, after running for the last 30, 40 years of firefighting, is to produce something solid that people can read, people can learn from it. People can relate themselves to this one because it has the culture and their values, and their principles. Yeah. This is the new thing. You might say, anybody can make a book, and produce a book. I said, yes. But not anybody can bring 10 or 15 or 20 people to write a book. And when you look at those 26, which are part of the first book, 
find that six of them were the thinkers and 20 of them were the people at your age with different experience. This is the challenge. You can write a book, you can do a lot of reading. Here's some, let me hear some. Get them and make a book. But this is your own understanding. Difficult to make those people to be on one platform and going one direction. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. And I hope that this, the second book, or the first book, will be published this year. The second book will be published next year. Once you go to this track, maybe the speed of the people comes after us will be faster. But they will know the way. Because you have paved the road or the track for them to walk or to cycle or to drive or to fly. And if you had uh, some books, some leaders that we could like learn from, yes, you have some like recommendation for us to read. What kind of book can be French English? I'm I'm not a good reader. I invite you, but I can send you to the previous CEO of the Islamic League, Nasser. He is a very good reader. The difference between him and myself: I'm a runner, and he is a reader. So he reads a lot, and he is the one who can guide you. If you want, I can put you in touch with him. Yeah, but I'm not a very good reader. Anything else? Last question from each one of you, or last statement from each one of you. What statement do you want people to listen to you? What advice do you want to give to the people who are going to listen to this uh, presentation? Give them people advice. Go on. What's your advice to them? Um, in relation to Islam? No, 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 no. no. Or... Your advice. Now maybe 50 or 100 people are watching, and you want to give them advice. What's your advice? Some of them are old, some of them are young, some of them are girls, some of them are boys, some of them are women and men. Well, some of them um, are Muslims, some of them are non-Muslims. Um, my advice with the uh, limited knowledge and experience that I, that I have in life, and given the age that I have, which is 29, um, my advice would be to always be true to yourself. Be truthful to yourself. Be true to yourself, because there are many... Uh, powers and impacts and effects that you can have from society, from family, from friends that can sort of deviate, that, that can make you deviate from what you want to actually do in life. And the best way to discover what you want to do in life is to be true to yourself. Be true to yourself, And, true to and okay. listen to your inner, inner voice. Inner voice, okay. And just pursue if you think and you're convinced that you are, you are pursuing in the right direction, you are going on the right direction, you, ju you just do it. All right. Thank you. Be honest with yourself. And be honest with yourself. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe what I'll say is, is connected to what uh, Ilya said, but I think we, uh, we should always, we should never forget the end goal of everything. That's right. That we are doing here. There's an end goal for an end goal. And there's a new end goal for every end goal. You understand? Yeah. This is Arabic. For every end goal, there's a new end goal. Yeah. There's endless end goals for every end for new end goal. You got it? <laughs> you don't get it? Yeah, I think this one. <laughs> what? There's nothing called an end. But there's for every end, there's a beginning. Yeah, yeah that's true. So when you say end, said no, 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 it's a beginning. Because you live till 2050, or 2070, or 2080. Okay? Who else would be after you? Another beginning. 
There's a beginning for every end and end for every beginning. You got it? This is Arabic. Go on. That's beautiful. Um, and yeah, when we have this vision of uh, where we are going, uh, and uh, let's not be, we can be distracted. That's right. Always we will be distracted. Yeah. We will be distracted, so we always should keep in mind for, for, for what, how to focus. Yeah. For what we are doing this yes. and uh, why. And um, uh, yeah. I wanted to add something, but I forgot. So yeah, yeah, and always keep listening and speak uh, when it's right. Yes. Very good, very good. Yes, sir. I really like the fact that my brother, my brothers, synthesize the the quote saying, "Trust the process, all the vision." So like, what do you say? Trust the process. So you hear talk about the process, you know, to 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 keep going, you know, and see it. And as someone hold the vision, do not forget where you go, you know. Yeah. Um, and to like the complementary with that, I would say the attitude define the altitude. What? The attitude define the altitude. What does it mean? That means that your manner, the way how you stand up, will define the altitude, how you raise up. You say, how you climb. How you climb. You how know, you be raising. Yeah. And then like how you go through life. How you go all of this, you know? That's that's Abu Qasim Shabbi. Allah my bad. Yeah, that's what so the attitude, if you don't, if you are afraid of climbing the mountain, you always will live inside the holes of rats exactly. and mice. Exactly. Attitude define the way to climb your altitude. All right, anything else? Because I can see one of the sisters here is pressing, saying, yeah. Why don't you say more? Yeah. But thank you. Thank, thank you. Sir. I think. Uh, what does that mean? Thank you for uh, sharing. I'm not saying to thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing the knowledge, as you said. Uh, it's the job, and I think the job is. Uh, well done. Yeah, well done. And uh, yeah, it will be uh, really helpful for us also, I think, to understand where. Uh, Islamic relief came uh, came from and also will help us also to have the right mindset when we work here not just as you said I think for career goals or even uh, um, other goals I think it's it's right for us because it will be it will help us also to um, share again this knowledge to new people that will come in the next month years uh, but also remind us that uh, we are in we are doing something uh, impactful and uh, that, that can really um, help and add value to, to, this, uh, to this world. So, yeah. Thank you. May Allah bless you. All right. So, for me, I learned a lot from being here since my late arrival two hours or more late uh, on Monday evening. My long waiting in Geneva airport, which does not look like a European airport anymore. It looks like a third world country airport. So you have hundreds of people waiting in a queue with one or two immigration officers dealing with them. When we were stuck in the airport, it was very hot, sweating, and I learned from that, that actually the high level quality of life, which you used to see in Geneva, is declining, unfortunately. And uh, maybe it's because of the resources. Maybe because we are overspending money differently on different uh, projects. This is something which was shocking me. That's why I requested for a wheelchair to stop me waiting and standing and walking for those hours. 
And this is something which is very, very important for me, a learning curve. The second learning curve is the discussion with you. The more you discuss your ideas with others, the more you learn from others. It's not one-way system. The more you discuss the idea, the more you reshuffle your idea, the more you'll be able to restructure your idea again. But as I said earlier on, or as we said earlier on, that idea is a structure of a building. So I learned a lot from these seven sessions, and I will learn a lot from other people as well. So as a traveler, or as passengers, you have to keep learning from different sources of knowledge, different sources of community uh, understanding. Because um, community understand the same topic differently. And what you can see is blue in this country could be seen green or white or red or black in another country. Thank you for teaching me. And thank Allah for giving me the power and the health to keep going. This is a great blessing from Allah. <laughs> now, Subhanak Allah Muhammadik, and Shadu Allah Asifrak wa Tabalak, wa Asr in Asan al Khus. إنما نوع المصلحات التواصل الحق والصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسامع مسلم ذا العالمين قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمنا ورحمكم الله سنداوان بري بارك الله فيك خبط الجمعة